Uh, good morning, everyone. Today is the 8th of January, the year 2008. I'm Bob Andrade, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participate in these conflicts. Today, I'm here at the museum along with fellow volunteer Jeff Gibbon. Uh, today, we have the honor and privilege of interviewing Hal Mueller. Hal uh, was a prisoner of war in the Battle of the Bulge. This was in 1944-45. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. Nice to have you here, Hal. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Turn it off now. Okay, Hal, uh, would you spell, spell your full uh, first and last name? First name Harold, H-A-R-O-L-D, also known as Hal, H-A-L, uh, last name Mueller, M-U-E-L-L-E-R. <clears throat> um, where were you born? St. Louis, Missouri. Well, how about your uh, parents, uh, your mother, uh, where's your father from? I'm sorry? Well, your father, where's he from? Well, he was he was born in uh, Collinsville, Illinois, which is just right across the river from St. Louis. And your mother? Uh, she was born in Maplewood, Missouri, which is a, a suburb of St. Louis. Um, how how did they meet? Do you know? Uh, well, they they both belong to a uh, in her teenage years. Well. I guess my mom was 18 and my dad was seven years older, so he was 25. And uh, they had what they called a young people's group at their church in Maplewood. And uh, he came there one Sunday to attend a church and they were having a little picnic after the church service. And uh, he saw this cute gal that he thought he'd like to get acquainted with. So he went over and began to talk to her, and it was my mother. Wow, do you, do you remember your grandparents at all? Oh, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about on, them? On, on both sides. Well, um, on my mother's side, um, the, um, well, going back to her grandparents, uh, they came over from Germany uh, right before the American Civil War, it would have been in about the 1838, 1840, right in there. And um, they came over from Germany because the Germans, the German Christians were being persecuted or they felt they were persecuted in, in, in Europe. And so these Lutheran Germans German Lutherans um, decided, let's go to America so we can worship freely as we as we choose. And so they were part of that immigration. And they came on on five little wooden ships. I mean, I'm remembering the story that my grandparents talked about. And four of those little ships made it to New Orleans one of them was lost at sea because they were sailing ships, got caught up in a storm and was lost at sea. They landed in New Orleans and there they got on a on a paddle wheel boat going up the Mississippi to to St. Louis and uh, in, in the area around about St. Louis. Some of them were tradesmen, there was uh, tinsmiths, carpenters, uh, painters, etc., that sort of thing, shopkeepers. Others were farmers, so some, so some of them went to a plot of ground oh, about 70 miles south of St. Louis, uh, right off the Mississippi River, which was a bottomland where periodically there was flooding, which would bring good, rich soil down from the Missouri River, on the plains, and it was a good place to Crops 
And so the farmers were in their in their environment and shopkeepers shopkeepers were in the towns where they could ply their trades. And uh, so that's the early history of that particular immigration. How was your father's side? Uh, my father's side, his father came uh, through America. Um, it was in the early 18, no, middle, middle 1800s. He was a teenager and he was over in, in Germany and it was the time of the a war that was called, the, or some historians call it the Seven Year War. Uh, others call it the uh, um, Franco-Prussian War, where France and Germany were going head to head. And in order to avoid being drafted into, into the military, he decided he would Go to go to America, and so he arrived in in Boston, and there he learned the uh, hair cutting trade, and um, so and he also met his future wife. Uh, in those days, frequently uh, well-to-do families would hire. Uh, teenage girls, young girls in their teens or twenties uh, to be like nannies for their children, taking care of them, you know. And so there was one of these young girls there in Boston that my grandfather on my dad's side, Conrad Miller, met this young lady and they fell in love and they got married, but then he decided he wanted to live in the Midwest, so he, he then came to Collinsville, Missouri, like I said, across the Mississippi from St. Louis, and he set up his his, his uh, barber shop there in Collinsville. Very, he was a loving man, but he was a man with a lot of personal ego, and he used to like to walk the, on Sunday afternoons and etc. He used to like to walk the, uh, the streets of the town and you know uh, elderly men in those days would have a cane, they always carry a cane or well, he wouldn't lean on his cane but he, he'd flick that thing like it was a, a baton you know and um, he was a real fun guy and I remember that frequently he would come to our home, particularly my dad would pick him up in the winter time and we had a nice home there in St. Louis that had a, uh, was a new home that my folks had built and had a big open fireplace and we always, particularly on Sunday evenings, we'd have a nice warm log fire going in the fireplace and then my, my grandfather then would begin to tell his, his uh, tales about his boy, his boyhood in Germany and uh, talked about the various things and I remember those things and so when I was a prisoner of war and the Germans marched us for oh I don't know miles and miles and miles uh, first to once what we call the Stalag which was a barbed wire enclosure and we'd be there for a few days and then they'd move on walking again to another one and I just went to three or four of those stalags but I noticed as we walked along and this was in the dead of winter when in I don't know how many kilometers and in miles maybe 50 60 miles in total we walked but as we were walking along there were different things that we noticed and uh, some of the guys were that were with me other prisoners were curious about these things and one of these things were great big hopped up piles of stuff on the side of the road and it was kind of black stuff and it had snow on top but it was kind of like steam coming off of it 
and he wondered what, what that was. I said, oh, I know what that is, because my grandfather talked about that. These were manure piles, and because the manure were laying like that in the cold weather would produce heat, and that heat would steam up and come up. And he also said people were very proud of their manure piles, because the bigger their manure pile was, meant that that's how many more cattle they had than anybody else. And so that was a mark of distinct, distinction. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. Uh, now, uh, your schooling, where was your schooling? Did, uh, your, your primary schooling on up, how did you, did you stay in the same town through your, all your schooling? Well, uh, beginning in the car, kindergarten, I was a member of the Lutheran Church and they had a, 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 a kindergarten through eighth grade grammar school and I went all the way through that grammar school and in 1938 I guess it was I graduated from uh, from Holy Cross Lutheran School and then I went to a public high school Cleveland High School in South St. Louis for four years. Yeah and uh, then you uh, then um, did you uh, were you involved in sports or anything while you were in school? Well I, I ran a mile run in in, in track and uh, got very much involved in in the art department and uh, in addition to the required subjects like English and math and took algebra uh, didn't get into trig and and calculus and, and those higher uh, mathematics but algebra and in art um, I was in art classes and I was uh, joined up the what they called the stagecraft which when the school would put on a, uh, on an activity a, a play or something like that we would build all the the um, scenery and that meant a lot of painting of tree foliage and that sort of thing so it was a lot of fun so I learned how to set up stage uh, settings too at the same time. Did you have any girlfriends? Oh uh, no, I had a gal that I kind of liked, but she had ambitions beyond mine. She she finally uh, married some guy whose husband or whose father was in what they called a green uh, farmer at that time. There were small, in addition to big farms around um, around St. Louis, there was small what they called truck farms, where guys farmers would grow specific crops, like, like they'd have, have a, a small corn field, a small field where they were growing asparagus, another uh, plot where they had uh, maybe carrots, another where radishes, and they'd, they'd harvest this stuff and take it into town, and there they'd have uh, places, there was a market where people would, could come and shop that would have all these things that had been grown in those places. And so uh, this girl that I had, uh, had a liking to, uh, she had her eye on the son of one of these guys because he was doing terrifically well. And I think she, th she thought more of, of what her future was going to be with him. I don't think she ever considered me as, as being husband material as far as she was concerned. Yeah, did you have any brothers or sisters? Uh, I was, I used to always say I was the ham in a ham sandwich. I had a sister that was three years older than I and a sister four years younger than me. So I was, I was the middle of three, three yeah. kids. How did you, can you remember uh, how you went through the uh, Great Depression? Uh, it was a bad time for my dad because he had in his, uh, uh, when he went to school, he uh, took up bookkeeping already in high school and then he went to a, uh, what they call the business college and took additional uh, classes there, and he was so well adapted to that 
that he became a, a teacher in that, in that uh, uh, training school for a while. And then he decided he didn't want to do that the rest of his life. So then he took up uh, his trade for a while for his, in his dad's barber shop. But he even used to tell stories about uh, he was one of, well, there, there were 12 children in his family. Uh, he had five sisters and there were seven boys. And each one of the boys was tra trained in the, bar in the barber shop when they were, say, five or six years old up to the time they were about eight or nine, they would, they would shine shoes in the, in the barber shop. And when it got to be about nine, then, then they were allowed to stand on a stool and trim around the, the sideburns and that sort of thing. And when they got a little older, then they, then they were allowed to shave. And I could, I could never conceive of that because they didn't have safety razors or electric they use a straight razor, you know, going, going on a guy's chin like that. I never let some kid <laughs> lather me up and have a straight razor in my throat, you know. But anyway, that's the way they did it in those days. And so, anyway, then later on, uh, well, from little on up, I never sat, I never had a, a professional uh, barber gave me a haircut. My dad always gave me a haircut. And uh, his older brother over in Collinsville had a barber shop. And so when we'd go over and visit him, then uh, my, my dad would put me in the regular barber chair and give me my haircut in that barber chair. And I always liked that because then I figured I was getting a real haircut. But he was, he was one, and he, one of the earliest ones of giving a, what we call the crew cut, you know, a butch. And so from the time I was, um, oh, probably eight or nine years old until I went into the service, uh, I was always had a, what well, my dad called the pompadour, which was a, a butch type haircut. And I, not until I got into the service did I ever have what I consider a real, professional haircut and that was just practically taken taking it down to the skin. Uh, do you remember your first uh, job you had? I mean as a first story? paying job? As, as a yeah I, I, when I was in high school got a job at a supermarket uh, first of all uh, what, what they called carry out and it was when people had their groceries that bagged up, and we offered to, to carry these groceries out to out to their car, and um, then um, a little later on, I was given a special job because um, this grocery store, in addition to having uh, packaged like beans and rice and and that sort of thing. He also had uh, these little little pretzels, stick pretzels, and the little round pretzels, and uh, and nuts. And so my department, I was down in a kind of a basement room to measure this stuff up by weight, and put them in bags, and then staple them in, so shut. And then they'd put them up on the others would put them up on the uh, uh, shelves up in the grocery store. So that was my job down there, is to, to yeah. weigh this stuff up. Do you remember, okay, we're getting close to the, the big wars now. Do you have, did you know anything was happening in China? Remember the, in 1937, the war started over in China. Did you know anything about it? Were you aware of what was happening in China? Do you remember the China Relief? We used to give money to the, to the uh, China Relief. Do you remember any of that? No, most of uh, my knowledge was okay. How about well, that? I knew a little bit about that something was going on over there, but uh, most of what we 
got in on news there in St. Louis and, and in school and so on and so forth about what was going on in Europe. And you were aware of, of, of the, the rise of Hitler, is that right? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Probably more than the regular person because uh -huh. you're being of German uh, descent, huh? Yeah, well, and his, uh, he, he was always finding excuses of why he should go against a certain, like the Czechoslovakians. He, um, he set up, of course this was revealed later on, it wasn't at the time, he claimed that the Czechs had attacked his troops, that he had them on the Czech border uh, to protect Germany, and uh, but when later on it came out that he uh, put some of his men in Czechoslovakian uniforms, staged an attack by these guys in his uniform against his own troops, and that gave him an excuse or why he could attack Czechoslovakia, and of course, then later on, he had he had Poland and uh, Greece and so on, so on, so on, so forth, and then of course he joined up with Mussolini from Italy. And of course, Mussolini was kind of a joke, but uh, uh, in a sense that he was not much of a military leader, but uh, uh, Hitler wanted. Mussolini's support because he he was thinking of expansion, expansion, and he wanted to go after the Greeks and uh, North Africa, and and Mussolini considered that his area. So instead of fighting Mo Mussolini, he mo made Mussolini his his uh, co-conspirator or, or co-ally, and helped him in fighting. In Ethiopia, there was a terrible slaughtering in Ethiopia, and these guys in Ethiopia, they didn't have weapons, you know, um, rifles and guns and stuff. They did all, they did all their fighting with, with spears and, and arrows. So that was a terrible slaughter over there. But he used every excuse he could to try to overrun people. Uh, now, did you have a uh, uh, kind of religious background at all? And oh yes, I. Um, I well, my I, I think I, I, I remarked earlier that my family was part of the German immigration to America in the 1800s, bringing the Lutheran Church over to America, and uh, they moved up. Then, I, my family ancestors moved up to the St. Louis area and uh, so all the way growing up through from kindergarten all the way through the eighth grade I went to the Christian day school. Yeah, and now do you remember your first car? Or did you have a first car? Uh, yeah, it was a, a used car because cause during the war years there weren't too many new cars being built, and so anyway, our first car was a Hudson. I don't know how old that thing was. No, it wasn't. No, there was a uh, a Buick, Buick with a long nose, not not the kind of a fat type of a Buick, but one with a great big long front nose, and it was green colored. And a personal friend of mine, he. he since it was this kind of a yellowish green, he called it the rolling P. <laughs> now, do you do you remember what were you doing on December the seventh, nineteen forty-one? Can you can you live I, that? Yeah, I was. It was a, on a Santa, Sunday afternoon. I was sitting at the kitchen table, uh, doing some homework for for Monday. You know, Mondays. Uh, in school, and uh, I was listening to some to some of the popular music at the time, and there were suddenly the music stopped, and a voice came on, a male voice said, "We interrupt this program to bring you a special message from the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt." And his voice came on, 
my fellow Americans, uh, I have the unhappy duty to inform you that this morning at about 7 o'clock a.m. in Pearl Harbor in the Hawaiian Islands, forces of the Imperial Forces of the Empire of Japan attacked our forces in Pearl Harbor. And even as I speak, that battle is going on. So that was my first. And that's when the Japs came in. We knew that Hitler was doing his thing, but it, and the only involvement up to that point um, for America was that we were called the um, warehouse for democracy. It was we were building the tanks and artillery pieces and the guns and so on and so forth and shipping them over to Europe through through they would go through England and then be distributed. And of course in those days, um, I don't know whether Russia was really considered an ally, but it was uh, later on they were described as fellow combatants. Because I don't think our government really uh, ever trusted Stalin and what he was going to be doing, who was the Prime Minister of Russia. Okay, you were still in school then when this happened, right? I'm sorry? You were still in school, in high school? Oh, yes. When this happened? Yeah, I was about 18 years old when, when FDR made this announcement. Okay, then when you graduated, uh, did, did you think about going in the, did you think about joining or uh, were you waiting for the draft or? No. Well, um, I had friends that volunteered to go in and uh, and uh, any number of them went in, but uh, no, I I was going to art school then and I wanted to continue my education as long as I could, but then I decided, I knew that eventually I was going to have to go, but at the same time, uh, I was having a lot of dental work done. Um, I was born with some, or as I, my teeth began to come in, it's a lot of them came in real crooked over here, and so I was wearing braces, and, and uh, uh, orthodontist was using different uh, things in their wires and stuff to try to pull my, my uh, uh, teeth in into space, right space. And in fact, eventually a lot of those teeth had to come out, and they were, and they were permanent teeth. And so, my wife said, no. So I've been boy wearing falsies ever since. <laughs> She's burying her face. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now. Uh, okay. So then, uh, uh, when did you go? When did you go into military? So, um, right after. Well, I had to register when, on my 18th birthday. I had to re register for the draft. Either volunteer to go in or register. Well, I registered, and um, then uh, there was a couple weeks then, or maybe almost a month, that I got my draft notice to report down to the, to uh, Jeff Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, which was south of St. Louis, about 20 miles or so. And uh, that was a permanent army base, had been ever since uh, the Civil War. And uh, that's where inductees were sent first, and from there were sent out to where, wherever they were going to be permanently uh, um, be part of a, you know, whatever branch of service and whatever their specialties uh, indicated that they should be in. And uh, so anyway, I went down to Jefferson Barracks and, and had a physical and I was 
um, okay to go on in. I was, I had all those qualifications, and uh, but I had a letter from my orthodontist that indicated this work that was being done on 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 my on my mouth, and that I would that he had about six months to a year of work to be done to complete this work, this plan that he was doing on my mouth. And so he uh, wrote this le letter to the, to the uh, draft board, and uh, he, he was sure that I would get the deferment because he was a personal friend of the, of the uh, officer down at the draft board that would be re receiving this request. And he actually phoned him in addition to me having this, this letter. And so anyway, um, when I got home, I told my mom about it. This was, of course, she was real upset because she figured, well, I was going to be going in pretty soon. But anyway, she says, well, you, you take that letter with you when you, when you go down to Jefferson Barracks and you show them so that you can get this deferment. Like I said earlier, so many of my friends were going into the service, and I didn't like the idea of getting shot at and whatever. But there was a term that was used in those days about being 4F, which meant you weren't fit for military service. And so anybody that was didn't go in of a certain age group, you figured either they were 4F, either they were physically incompetent or mentally incompetent. And I thought, no, I can't, I can't do that. I can't let that happen. So I went down to Jefferson Barracks, and I didn't show that letter. And so when I got home then, and my mom said, well, what happened, what happened? I said, Mom, they, didn't, they wouldn't accept that excuse. And I, I lied to her, so. But I didn't want to be designated as a 4F. <laughs> so anyway, so, that, so then I was called into service. And uh, because of going to art school, they decided I would be good in the camouflage engineers, which were specialists that could hide trucks and tanks by covering them with, with uh, big uh, nets. And they'd, they'd weave bushes and stuff into them and, and, and colored strips of a burlap and so on and so forth, so that spotter planes from the from the air could not pick those things out. What did they pick up? Uh, did they they, uh, did they test you at at the basic training boot camp? Where they picked that up? The, your your abilities. I'm sorry. Um, that's where they where they found out that you had this ability. Well, it was picked up at uh, at at uh, basic training. Oh, right, right, right after I went in, yeah, and. Uh, uh, like I said, I was drafted there in St. Louis and, and went down to Jefferson Barracks. And then when I got my shipping orders, I was being sent out to sunny California. And they put me on the train, me and a few other guys. And we arrived in Indio and uh, uh, to a camp out there called Camp Young. That's where uh, Patton was training his tank corps, and of course, so we were out there too, at the same time, uh, camouflaging uh, gum and gun, these big howitzers, and, and uh, what they called uh, uh, long-range rifles, which were a gun on wheels, and could fire shells quite a distance, and and trucks and and uh, tanks and etc. like that, and uh, so 
what we would do is we had guys in our group, a bunch of Mexicans, those were the laborers parts, those weren't the technicians, but they would they would dig a, a big rectangular hole that you could drive a tank down into or a truck and then we then we cauliflowers would cover that with a with this netting, net netting rather, and weave this this uh, burlap material in there, with, which was colored different shades of brown and and off color green and so on and so forth. And then we take actually cut actually uh, rough uh, bushes out in the out in the uh, desert and put them here and there. The, you know, so it would look, it would look like the, the hills and the mounds around the desert. So so from the, the spotter planes couldn't spot these trucks and so on and so forth. Yeah, you know, you're probably the first uh, person we've interviewed uh, about Camp Young, and it's a good time now. I think to tell us, if you could tell us a little bit about what it was like, you know, uh, like the, uh, the time of the year, the heat, you know, and what it was like to train out here in the desert, especially being from from uh, Missouri. Well, uh, this was late February and early March, so it was very pleasant getting out here in the California desert, as uh, uh, the the day that I had to go down to. Um, down there to, uh, um, to the first camp there, down in Jefferson Barracks. It was a cold, cold day. Snow on the ground and sleet was coming down and so on and so forth. And got down to Jefferson Barracks. And so it'd be put on a plane, uh, on a train, and to travel out to sunny California and got, got off that train uh, in Indio and I think that, you know, the weather was probably like it is right here now in the 60s. And boy, that just felt like summer weather. That was great. And, uh, and they put us, there were, oh, there were about 75 of us or something like that who were, that came out there and got off that train. And so they had a couple of those personnel carriers, you know, that could, hold about 30 guys, 30, 35 guys. And uh, so we crawled into those trucks and they drove us out to out to Camp Young, which is out by near an area called Kiriaka Summit, which isn't far from Indio, it's this, this side of Indio. Then uh, uh, how long, did, how long uh, did you do this desert training? Before you sent overseas. Well, that was a that that. Well, I went through various. I think I had three different three different uh, uh, basic trainings I went through. Because uh, I went through that one, that first one out here at uh, at Camp Young, and then we had a big bulletin board, and we were always told, keep your eye on the bulletin board because you'll be told certain unusual things or important things that you're not verbally told while you're lined up in the ranks. And so I kept my eye on it. Then I so saw so one day after we had finished basic training that they had something that they called ASTP, which is Army Specialized Training Program. And so I inquired about that, and uh, already the war was progressing on to a point where uh, the authorities, our American authorities, were so sure we were going to win this war, both in Europe and in the Pacific, that they wanted to prepare for for uh, uh, conditions after the war with these subjugated people, people, you know, these regimes that were totalitarian, uh, how to, to 
try to get them to operate more in a democratic sort of a condition and attitude. And so they were training people that had skills in linguistics and uh, um, and uh, there was, you know, various languages. Uh, those who were good in psychology and those who could be trained to help setting up uh, civilian governments set them on democratic principles. So I signed up for that program. They sent me to, to uh, Bloomington, Indiana, where I went to the <coughs> uh, to the University of, of uh, Indiana there in Bloomington, and I was signed up for for the um, the um, setting up these uh, little civilian new civilian type governments and so on, so democratic governments. Well, I wasn't there very long, and they. They gave us all kinds of subjects. I did, I did well in English. Always did in school, and I was good in algebra. But then they start getting into, into uh, um, trig and calculus and all that kind of stuff. And boy, they just left me in a fog. And also they had chemistry. Well, I had taken physics in high school and did that well too. But all I knew in Chemistry was H2O was water, and that was about it. And so I knew I was going to wash out. But the good old uh, bulletin board saved me again because I saw a notice on the bulletin board that anybody who could pass certain uh, physical attributes uh, could sign up for the Air Force if if we would um, meet certain criteria. So I, so I signed up for the Air Force and uh, they, uh, they tested me in uh, various ways like uh, oh, peripheral vision, which, where, where, how, how far you can see see something moving here on the side and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, they decided that I would be a, be good at navigation on a um, on a bomber. I wouldn't be a good fighter pilot. And I was sure of that myself. They didn't have any fool there. And uh, but on a on a bomber crew that I would be uh, I guess I could be a navigator and uh, so anyway, so they, I was shipped down to Shepherd Field, Texas, which is just south of, of the Oklahoma border. And there I went into basic training again for the Air Force. And uh, so I finally finished that up. And I was to ship out to um, out here to California, and I forget what the, their um, their field was. I was to train, take navigator training, and the morning I was supposed to ship out, I was called in, and a few other guys were called in too. <coughs> they were supposed to ship out with me, and individually we were told. Uh, we're winning the war in Europe, and we're doing real well in the Pacific, and so we don't need any more uh, air, air uh, uh, personnel. So congratulations, you're in the infantry. And so if you don't feel, I think that was like jumping out of a plane without a parachute, going from the Air Force, into the infantry, where I knew it was going to be slugging it, you know, by foot, <laughs> sleeping in wet, muddy foxholes and, and what have you, you know. But anyway, so then I was shipped to, to the 
to uh, a training pod in Oklahoma to, and that's where the 42nd Rainbow Division was training, getting ready to, to head for Europe. And so that's how I got into the infantry. And that's where I was until the rest of my military career. Okay, then you went, you went uh, when you were shipped overseas, where was the first place you landed? What ship, do you remember what ship you were on? Yeah, it was, it was one of those, uh, uh, remember the, the guy by the name of Henry? Kaiser. Kaiser, where he built those Kaiser cars, and uh, there was another car that he built too. And so he built, in his, in his, in his operation, he built a bunch of these, what they call victory the ships. ships. and victory ships, I think they called them. They were, they were made out of wood, you know. <laughs> and so, so on our way over to, to Europe, we zigzagged all the way, trying to, you know, stay out of the way of submarines. And we always had uh, a bunch of destroyers zipping around us to keep an eye for, out for submarine. So anyway, we made it over to Gibraltar, went through the Straits of Gibraltar into the Mediterranean Sea, and all, almost as far into to, uh, to the end of the sea as that ship would go, which was the port of Marseille, France. And there at Marseille is where we disembarked and were put on trucks and uh, moved to Strasbourg, France. And we stayed in Strasbourg for a few days and put in trucks again and then taken up to the Rhine River uh, near a town of Haldensleben. Do you remember what, what year that what year and month? On what, what month that was? Uh, well, it was winter yet. And so that was. Latter part of February, yeah, the latter part of February, and because uh, I know it was it was cold, we stood guard duty at night, you know, and and uh, we we did take a, a depression in the ground when we got up there to, to the front, um, that a hole about as big big as this room, and about as deep as up to those shelves there. And then, so we would get down in that hole and covered, it, covered ourselves up with tarpaulins. And, and a couple of guys would be on duty, but about six of us would be in that over, overnight at one time. And we take turns, two, two guys at a time, always peeking out from under that tarp see that there weren't any Germans sneaking up on us. And uh, that's where we were the morning that, or January 5th, when the Germans came through and completely surrounded us. And that was the start of my, uh, my uh, time as uh, the guest of the German government. Could you, uh, it was January, the, do you remember the date? That was January the 5th. January 5th. And so I was a prisoner of war from January the 5th until April the 13th. And that's when we were liberated. And it was Friday the 13th. So if I've ever been so, so, so superstitious, I'm positively superstitious. There's nothing wrong with Friday the 13th. Yeah. Some people won't do anything on Friday the 13th. <laughs> they figure it's bad luck. Okay, then you you were you were captured. How were you captured? Were you just uh, surrounded, or well, um, how how I, were you was, there before you were captured? Pardon? How long were you there before you were captured? Out out there, uh, outside of Strasbourg, right? Uh, in Haldensleben, we were there probably a couple of days, and uh, so I I drew guard duty on. On, uh, I guess that was January the 4th, um, and, uh, and like I said, there were six of us that were part of that guard detail, 
So at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning, I was awakened uh, and another guy with me to go out and, and be on, take out a uh, shift on, on guard duty and, and uh, oh, probably about 6.30, something like that. I was thinking about getting to close to a warm fire and a nice warm breakfast and suddenly there was this kind of a funny sound, kind of a poofing sound and and uh, a um, what I call it, um, what was it was a um, it was shot out of a mortar I know but it was it floated down on a, on a, on a on a little, on a parachute, I guess. <clears throat> but it was a flare that lighted up the whole area. And uh, then another one, poof, went up another. And so the whole area was lit up by, by these flares. And then they start dropping mortar shells. And they're dropping mortar shells. And, and, then, and then there was, uh, from the German side, there were small arms uh, fire. And uh, at the same time, then, of course, this woke up all the rest of our group, and they all grabbed their rifles and, and uh, came out and, you know, and started shooting back at the Germans. And uh, so, anyway, and uh, we, we battled for, I don't know, for an hour and a half or so. And then a couple of our guys found out after a couple of our guys got killed. A couple of them got um, got shot, but were wounded. And then our our company commander. I always have thought of him. What a what a goofball! Because <laughs> he got so excited, he was like a like a, a cheerleader out in front. Shoot her! There they are, men! Shoot, shoot! And he's running up and down and down, you know. And suddenly he goes, oof! He grabbed his leg and down he went. Well, then he wanted to surrender. And he, he argued with some of the uh, other officers, lieutenants in our group, and they finally decided, yeah, well, they would, they would uh, surrender. And so they did. They ran up the white flag. And then the and of course the Germans surrounded us, and uh, they weren't. Fortunately, and I've always said, the Lord was with, with me during that, you know, or with us during that situation. Even then, as prisoners, because we were captured by, by regular Wehrmacht, the regular army troops. They were old. To me, they were old guys. I was. I had just. Uh, I was in my 20s. I, I uh, spent my 21st birthday in the in the, in the German uh, as a German prisoner of war. But I but uh, most of these guys were the Germans were guys in their 50s, and to me that looked old. <laughs> and uh, and uh, then I, I guess well, real young guys. 15, 16 years old or something like that, because they were part of the youth, the Hitler Youth uh, Corps, you know. And uh, so, and oh boy, their uniforms were threadbare and patches. They had patches upon patches. I mean, we had a, you know, our, our uh, Class A uniforms and, and you know, and our, and our, uh, uh, Warm, strong boots and and overcoats and all that kind of stuff. And these these guys, they they had patches upon patches in their uniforms. And, but anyway, they had us. They had us rounded up and uh, and marched us to the Rhine River, which was a couple of blocks away. 
and then there they put us in what I would call over oversized uh, rowboats. They were about this wide, about twice as long as this room, and they could get two, ten of us in a boat, plus three Germans. One of them was the guy that would run the outboard motor out the back, and two of them would sit there with their rifles so that we wouldn't pull up any funny business. And of course, they, before they marched us down to these boats, they knocked the helmets off our heads and checked us for weapons, and uh, even down to our mess kits. Uh, so we, we could, you know, we had knives or anything like that. They took those away or threw them away from us. And so anyway, so that's how we were captured. And they began to, to march us in, and we walked and walked and walked. Wait, wait, no, okay, ready? Okay, go. The Rhine River. There's Strasbourg. And of course, that little town which is. Okay, ready? Okay, go. The Rhine River. There's Strasbourg. And of course, that little town, which isn't noted on here, it was right on the river at Haltensleben. And so there we were put in those, what I called oversized rowboats, and taken across the river. And, and well, I guess we were, well, I shouldn't say guess. Anyway, we were taken to Stalag 5 here at Offenburg. And we were only there for a short length of time, I say short length of time, maybe three days. And they got us out and started walking us again. And then we went down here to Stalag 5B, Villenburg. I remember that. We were pretty close to Switzerland at that point. <clears throat> okay, you're you're at the Stalag VB, right? And then we're from there. And then, well, we were there for probably three weeks, as I recall. And then, and they called us out one morning, and they said. We're going to send you back into your, well, they weren't actually barracks, but the, but uh, these horse barns were where you've been bunking in and uh, gather up all your personal stuff. And then when we blow the whistle, you come back out here and line up again because you're going to have to go on work cruise, and you won't be coming back here again. So I have everything, all your stuff with you. And so that's what we did. And so at that time, then after we got back in the formation, they separated out the um, already earlier, right after we were captured, they had separated out all the commissioned officers, you know, first and second lieutenants and captains, etc. And, uh, but then, now, um, on this particular morning, when they say we're going to bring out all our, you know, all our, bring out all our stuff, and they took everybody that was a rank from corporal on up and they were going to be taken off someplace else. Whatever happened to them where they, where they went, I have no idea. And so 
then a day or two after that then they began to walk us again and I don't remember exactly how far or where they took us and uh, we were the way the way I've been able to describe that area of Germany it was like I describe it as like uh, here in the United States in uh, areas like Illinois and Indiana where you have major highways but then there are secondary roads that are paved but a lot of times they're just gravel roads and, and are semi-paved or they're, they're not they're not high speed highways um, and you know and you have a town about every five five to seven miles you drive out of one town and it's not long you're you're coming to the entrance to another town and that's the way the towns were over there and but uh, the only thing we saw on those main highways going by would be German military vehicles and then on the secondary roads where you see people driving farm wagons and there were too many of those and the pedestrians and that's that's where we were walked on these on these secondary roads but anyway I do remember this town of Villigan and then there there was a stalag there with a stalag 5B 5B? 5B okay yeah and we were there for probably six six days and yeah, that's when they told us that we were going to uh, be leaving and we weren't coming back to that area and to bring all your personal belongings, whatever you have, and you're going to be sent out on work detail. <clears throat> and uh, so they said, well, now we're going to give you an opportunity to volunteer on your work details and uh, if if we don't get enough volunteers then we'll just give it the old um, military way um, you 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 and you and uh, so anyway so they called out a hundred guys that were going to go on some project somewhere and I don't know what it was um, and that didn't and they got their hundred guys together and, and they moved on with them. Then they had a, another hundred that they needed and uh, they called up wherever that was. And my buddy McCoy and myself, we weren't interested in that either. Then they said, okay, now we need 40 volunteers and this uh, group is going up into the northern part of Germany uh, to cut wood. We thought, hey, that sounds that sounds pretty good. We're, uh, and so anyway, so then we were put in on on a train, and uh, there are these little small trains. Maybe you've seen a uh, wartime movie like uh, um, oh, I'm trying to think of Schindler's List, that movie, and uh, and uh, I remember when I was a kid on uh, Armistice Day, I guess it was, or Veterans Day. They'd always have a big parade in St. Louis, and of course the VFW was part of that, and the 
and American Legion, and they have big floats and and bands and so on and so forth. And they they they'd always have uh, a couple of these little kind of boxcar things, but they weren't on. They they removed them off of the. Uh, you know, the kind of wheels that you have to run on a track and put regular wagon wheels on them or something like that, or, or inflatable wheels and pulled by a couple of horses. <coughs> but there was a, um, a um, veterans group out of World War I that they called them the 40 and 8s, because these were guys that during World War I uh, when they traveled anywhere in, in France and Germany, they were called the 40 and 1 because these little boxcars would car carry, uh, or 40 and 8, these little boxcars would carry 40 men and 8 horses. That's where, they, <coughs> that's where they got the 40 and 8 part. And so these, these veterans, they had their own organization. And, uh, but anyway, we didn't have any horses with us. They put us in this train, and uh, they had two 50-gallon uh, drums they put aboard in, in, the, uh, in this um, uh, car that we were in. And I don't know how many of these cars there were in addition to the en engine and, and the uh, coal tender, and uh, I don't even know if the thing had a caboose on the end. But anyway, uh, so um, there were 35 or 40 of us in our particular car, and um, the door was shut, they padlocked it, and uh, the only and it was cold. It was in the dead of winter, so we knew we didn't need any heat. But you kind of kind of like to have the idea that you kind of had a wondered where, where where we might go be going, and and uh, country or or the neighborhoods or whatever we're going through or through the towns. So there was like a little up up near the near the roof. There was like a little window about this wide that you could slide open and so so we we take turns looking out to see what the scenery looked like going by and if there was anything unusual you could report to the rest of the guys in the car. But anyway I don't know how many days we were in that car and they would stop periodically at some town. Uh, when I say periodically maybe twice a day, and they'd refill the uh, our fresh water barrel and empty out, take out the, the latrine barrel. And they always had, um, at those places where they stopped, they, uh, they had some workers there that could Germans gave them this this uh, latrine duty, and uh, they were people from I don't remember um, they weren't Russians. Uh, They were from an area up near 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 Russia, or up in here, and um, forget what they called them. But anyway, um, they they were the ones that would take those those uh, buckets in and out, the water bucket and the latrine bucket, and uh, fill up the water bucket and uh, and empty the latrine bucket. And uh, never thought at the time, but every once in a while I've wondered since, whether they ever got those buckets 
switched around, and I don't even like to think about that. But anyway, in the dead of winter, didn't do too much drinking, but didn't want didn't want to drink a lot because you know it would make it inconvenience if you if you had to wait till they stopped somewhere before you could relieve yourself. But anyway, we we uh, traveled for a couple of days until we got up into into northern Germany, and I'm still looking here. Lukenwald, eh? And there's Mark. Is that one of the places you stopped or you, or you well, stayed? Well, this is where we were for a while. This Lukenwald, eh? And there's Magdeburg. And eventually when we were, when we were, uh, when we were, uh, liberated, we, Traveled to Magdeburg and then, and then, uh, see, they don't show some of these small towns that we were in. But anyway, yeah, we, we rode, and of course, this, this train was going very slow and it would slop, stop frequently, like I said, because they, they used the same tracks. We're going north and south, and uh, for troop trains and and uh, uh, you know German troop trains and and for whatever else, commerce and so on and so forth, freight trains, etc. And so the train did a lot of stopping and starting, and uh, but uh, so. Eventually, we did end up here, like I say, at Luchenwald. Oh, here's Berlin right up here. And uh, so, uh, and, but eventually when, when we were at Magdeburg, uh, we saw a lot of uh, planes American and British planes, bombers, flying east, and they were heading primarily for Berlin, and they just hammered and bombed the heck out of out of Berlin, and uh, we, we we could actually see not not the actual flames, but the but the reflections of the fires. That were reflected against the cloud cover here and there, you know, that was was over Berlin, and uh, so anyway. Next question. Okay, did they uh, some of those um, POWs from that area? They would line them up and they would ask uh, Jews to step out. Did you have? Did they, they have any special orders for the, any of the American Jews that were? Understand, a lot of them carried two uh, two dog tags. Well. No, we had we had two guys in our outfit that were Jewish. One was uh, remember his his name Saul uh, Lipnick, and uh, I forget what the other guy's name was. But uh, I don't know how how good the Germans were at looking at a guy and deciding he was Jewish or not. But they. They, they begged everybody not to, not to give, 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 give away the fact that they were, um, um, you know, that they were Jewish. And then one other situation too is when we were captured, um, we had uh, this young, lanky, tall, lanky guy from West Virginia, and. Uh, I forget what his name was, but he was a BAR man, a BAR, a Browning Automatic Rifle, and it almost fires like a machine gun. Uh, you can either shot, pull off one shot at a time, or you hold the trigger back, 
and go boom, 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 boom like that, you know. And uh, it has a magazine, a uh, cartridge magazine, get how many shots, how many shells are in there, but uh, 16 to 20. So, uh, in this magazine, and uh, this one. This guy from West Virginia, his last name was Isbell, and I don't know what his first name was, but he was positioned in such a, such a place that where the Germans were coming across this, this bridge, attacking our position, they were coming across this bridge, and uh, our commander positioned Isbell where he could look right over that, that bridge, and as they came over that bridge, he was just peppering away at them. And so when when we were finally being captured and surrounded, he begged everybody, don't tell him who the VAR man was, because he, <laughs> because he, he, he took so many of those guys out that he figured they, they treat him very unkindly. <laughs> Now, could you speak German? Uh, no. You couldn't speak any German just, at all? Just a few naughty words. But okay. yeah. <laughs> Did you get any special treatment because you had a German last name or worse well, treatment? When I was first captured, and that happened to each of us, and I never really discussed it with any of the other guys, but we were taken in for interrogation, and it was on a one, one by one, and like I say, I never did discussed the thing with the other guys. But the guy that I was with was in a little room probably about as wide as this one and not much longer than the width there. It was a, a small room. A guy, um, well, in my 20-year-old eyes, he looked like an older guy, but he was probably maybe in his 50s or something like that. Nice, nicely dressed in a, in a suit, white shirt and tie, and uh, spoke very good English. Of course, most people in in Europe speak good English. I mean, you know, early history, French was universal language, and then English then became the, uh, the universal language spoken by most people would speak, speak more than just their native tongue when, when, uh, when, you know, when the British Empire became so broad, you know. But anyway, this guy says, um, and of course, we were, we were told that if you're ever captured, all you're allowed, all you're required under the Geneva Convention is to give your name, rank and serial number. And you don't have to give them any more than that. And so that was it. So this guy is interviewing me and so he says, I I see your I see your last name. He says, Don't you feel badly about coming over here and and shooting at your cousins? <coughs> I said, I don't have any relatives over here. <coughs> um, <coughs> I said, I'm, I'm fourth generation American. And so I said, I don't, and so I don't figure anybody else over here that has the same last name. That goes back so many generations. That doesn't have any, any meaning for me. And so anyway, the guy got it. He accepted that. He didn't get nasty with me or anything like that. But no, seeing my last name, he wanted to know how I could come over there and shoot at my cousins. Did any of the American troops give you a hard time for the German last name? No. I'm an American. What? Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. You said, I have no cousins here. I'm an American. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I told him. Yeah. I'm an American. <laughs> No, but there was there was some kid in high school, and I had nothing to do with the war. But the war was already going on in Europe before, and this was before 
America got into it, and his his last name was Hitler. <laughs> well, the kids really kidded him about it, you know, but not mean, but just just kidded him about it. His last name was Hitler. Could you feel that the war was coming to an end by by seeing the the, the fires in Berlin, and could you feel? Could you guys feel this? The war coming to an end. Well, that I we knew our side was winning, and uh, and I remember too that uh, the day that that uh, FDR, the president, died, and of course, you know that that came over over the air on BBC, the British Broadcasting, and of course the. The, uh, although the Germans were not supposed to be tuning in on BBC, but they, they did anyway. And so that morning, uh, the guards asked, asked us, uh, hey, Mr. Rose, and they called him Rosenfeld, because the Germans were sure they, they accused him of being Jewish. You know, Mr. Rosenfeld is dead, so the war is over. We said, oh, it is. Well, yeah, because they, they figured if say anything happened to Hitler, it would be over for them, you know. We said, no, he, so he's dead. Now we have a vice president that takes over, and if anything happens to the uh, vice president, we have a, a succession. That's what, a, that's what a democracy is all about. And I said, I know the next one in line after, after uh, um, oh, Harry Truman would be the Secretary of Labor, whoever that was. I don't know why, why that particular position. But anyway, they, they had a ch uh, chain of succession that uh, would go through the whole cabinet, you know, which is, I don't know how many people, 10 or 12 different people before they would run out of leaders. And we were sure. Some general would take over or something like that, you know. So anyway, yeah, but because Roosevelt was dead, that meant we were going to surrender. How were you treated in general in, in, in those Daleks? Now that you're you're at the you're at your last Dalek now. Well, like I think I perhaps mentioned earlier, I always figured that um, part of the Lord's blessing is. For me, and his, part of his protection was that I wasn't captured by under any of these rabid, uh, you know, SS types. And uh, there was another bunch that were um, pretty, pretty radical as far as hatred and, and uh, things that they, they did to people that. Uh, or, or under their uh, control, but uh, these were regular, regular German army troops, and uh, you know, I hear these guys can't agree with what they're doing, but they're they're going to they're going to obey their commanders and so on and so forth. What are they going to do? Refuse to do the carry out their orders, you know? Okay, how now, you're now, can you tell us that day, what it was like when you were liberated? Oh my, what a day that was. Um, well, like I say, through the BBC, British Broadcasting, um, news of how the different forces were moving and so on and so forth were reported, and I uh, guards, I think they definitely saw the handwriting on the wall. They, you know, and they, they were moderately friendly. They would talk through the through the through the fence of some of our guys, and a couple of our guys could speak real good German. And of course, the Germans could speak decent English. And uh, they would tell us what they had heard on BBC, but. Uh, the BBC reports uh, 
would report where the Russian troops were, Russian forces were, and the British American, you know, troops were. And so we were always pulling <laughs> for our guys to get there, not the Russian. We figured those stupid Ruskies are going to shoot every any any uniform that isn't one of theirs, you know. And so on uh, on Friday, uh, oh, we were before that. It was on Wednesday, the. 11th of April, 1945. Um, uh, one of our, one of our guys, kind of watching through the, through the fence, said, "Hey, there's a bunch of civilians out here." Well, they weren't civilians; they were actually, actually, uh, our German guards, but they were all in civilian uniforms, or civilian clothing. And they had bicycles, and they were, they, they, they said they were taking off, they were going home because uh, a day or two before, um, their commanding sergeant or whatever had gotten uh, discharge papers for each one of them, signed by some officer that had the authority and so at any time that they felt that they had to take off and get out of there, they could fill in their name and the date and that would be there so they could. So, so they, it wouldn't be called desertion, right? So they weren't called deserters, yeah, right. And so they were taking off. So anyway, so one of our guys said, well, can we have the key? Can you open up the gate so we can get out of here? No, 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 no. we can't do that. Well, they were afraid maybe some of our guys, just out of meanness and retaliation for whatever, would maybe jump them, you know. So we always said, well, whoever was talking to them said, well, why don't you select somebody among your group Maybe the guy is the best bike rider or whatever. Let the others go, and then the last thing that guy will do as he's pedaling off is throw those keys over the over the fence, you know. And so uh, they agreed to do that. So anyway, so we, we opened up the gate, but then we we agreed among ourselves that don't anybody take off because we don't know where those crazy. Russians are, or even some German troops that are going to see, you know, see you run around in what's left of your American uniforms, and you're going to, you know, you're going to, you're going to get knocked off, you're going to pay for your foolishness. So all of our guys stayed around, but a few of them uh, wanted to go into the neighborhood and get something other than that, that sour bread that was our, our you know, our main food all the time. And they would go to some houses and knock on the door and ask for food. And, and well, <coughs> most of the time, they would be uh, denied, you know, any handouts. But then when they, they would say something among themselves about the Ruskies, or they right away, the people would be a little bit more cooperative and would give them some eggs and maybe some better bread than that sour, sourdough stuff we had. And uh, so anyway, so that way we supplemented our meal. Well, and I want to, one other thing I want to report to that I had a, a kind of a pretty good deal in that the, the first day or the second day that, that we were there in that stalag by the stone quarry. Uh, the question was that, is there anybody here that can cook? Well, why I raised, raised my hand, well, I was no cook, but I used to hang around the kitchen when my mom was making stuff, and I figured, they're not going to make any 
anything fancy here. And when it says cook, that means getting close to the food. So they said, well, when the rest of the guys each day have to go down into the stone quarry at about 8 o'clock in the morning, and you'll come down here by, by the house that belongs to the owner of the stone quarry, and, uh, and you'll help this lady that, that makes the soup. So you'll peel potatoes and anything else that she wants done. And so, anyway, uh, so every morning, and then at noon time, when there's a noon break, and they come up out of the quarry, then in the afternoon you join them and you go down to the quarry, and you help in the afternoon using sledgehammers, breaking, you know, big ones and the little ones down there in the stone quarry. So every morning I would go down to the cook shack and and peel potatoes and scrape carrots, and uh, in the afternoon I'd go and join them down there. Well, in the afternoon it was starting to warm up because the sun was, and then, so I didn't get frostbitten fingers and so on because we had no gloves. And uh, so it would, well, it wasn't, the conditions down there in the quarry were, because it was a pit type quarry, not a, not a, tunnel underground, and so um, that meant weather conditions were so bad in the afternoon. And then on Saturday before Easter was again a work day for us, and uh, I went back down to the, the uh, um, quarry owner's house. The, to uh, again do my my KP duty of peeling potatoes or whatever, and so when I was doing you know, as I was doing my work, uh, the owner of the uh, of the uh, or the wife of the owner of the quarry she came in and, and she asked me, well. Uh, you celebrate Easter at home? Yeah. Well, what happens? I said, well, Easter morning we go to church service to worship the, the risen Lord. And then usually after that we go over to my grandma's house for, for a, a big dinner. But then I said, then for the for the kids, then there, we have colored eggs at, at uh, one of the grown-ups' hives, and we go for an Easter egg hunt. And so, anyway, then she, I went back to doing my my scraping and <laughs> peeling of potatoes. A little while, she came came back and and. Uh, had something wrapped in white paper, like butcher paper, and uh, when I opened it up, it was a piece of coffee cake about, about this size, and crumb cake, and uh, she said, uh, she said, I've been saving the ingredients for this for this cake for quite a while for my for my family for Easter, but she says I I wanna I, I wanna share it with you and so she said, So I'm gonna stand here in the doorway and you go ahead and eat it and don't eat it pretty fast. But if I give you a signal, you quick hide it because the guards are not getting any of this. And I will get real angry at you and at me for me sharing this with you. So anyway, so that that's how I spent Easter on that particular day. Still doing my my cooking duties and eating this delicious coffee cake. I bet it didn't take long to eat it though, did it? No, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
Anyway. So next question. Okay, now you're okay. Now, show the moment of liberation. The gates open, and there was the Americans. What did they do with you? Did they, did they uh, well, interrogate you or well, on, debrief on, you? On 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 the eleventh, we were liberated on on the thirteenth. But on the eleventh, that's when these guards uh, hop, put on their civilian clothes, hopped on their bicycles, and took off. And so, anyway, on. Um, on the 13th, on a Friday the 13th, uh, and we were there, and I, you know, we could get in and out of our prison camp because they left the keys with us, but like I say, a couple of guys kind of scavengered in the neighborhood for some extra food, but other than that, we stayed right there, and on, on that morning around, oh, probably 8 o'clock or so, uh, we could hear a, a, a tank coming from a distance. It was going to be coming from from the west, and um, and we could see down this road, oh, probably for about the distance of about two city blocks, and then the road went around the corner, and we couldn't see, it, but we could tell the tank was coming from that direction. And uh, so we were watching, and so first the jeep came around the corner, and then followed right behind the jeep was a was a tank, tank, and both the jeep and the tank had White Star, and so we knew it was American because it was uh, Russian who had been red. So anyway, so the jeep was a uh, was a uh, jeep. The additional jeep driver was a uh, first or second lieutenant, and then. Behind him was this tank. Well, they were out, out on the reconnaissance, uh, but they said they would radio back to the main in, a, in a, our main lines, American lines, and give our location. And within a few days, then, it, then some somebody would come transportation to get us out of there. And so that was on the 11th. Then on. Friday the 13th of April, uh, by mid-morning, uh, we heard, you know, the sound of motors and, you know, here comes another jeep around the corner with a white star and a couple of, uh, of these big uh, troop carriers, you know, things that have benches on each side and then a uh, seat about Oh, 14, 15 guys, and in each, and so they were there to take us back out of there, and so we loaded up, and didn't have much personal belongings to, to uh, load up with, and then we traveled to. Hanover. I'm trying to see where Hanover is. Oh, well, here's Hanover. Keep your finger on it. Right here. And so in Hanover. Yeah. And put your so finger on Hanover. Put your finger on Hanover. I, I, I missed it. Hanover is right there. There you go. Got it. Yeah. And in Hanover, uh, when it had been. In America, or in German hands, was a training field for the Luftwaffe, and so they had the bar barracks there, 
and the landing fields and so on and so forth. But at Hanover uh, was where the uh, American planes now would, a lot of them would land there and take off from there. And so, anyway, so we were there in Hanover for about three or four days. And uh, then we were taken by, by truck uh, trying to see from where, where we were taken. I don't see England on here. <laughs> but anyway. But anyway, we were taken by truck from Hanover uh, to to the coast. And there we were taken over to, to England. By the coast did you go through the Netherlands or uh did you the Netherlands at yeah, all? It could or? be, because there's the North Sea. So England's probably over in here somewhere. So, uh, so we were taken by hand over here. Anyway, to the coast here. And they were put on ships and taken over to Wilmington. Uh, which is a harbor not far from from London in, uh, in Great Britain in England and we were there for a few days and then we put off to sea in those little wooden ships and I don't know there three or four of those ships with a squadron of destroyers and uh, we made that voyage all the way across the Atlantic Ocean and came in at New York Harbor. And How the Statue of Liberty looked to you? Destroyers were zipping back and forth all the time, watching for summer, German submarines. Yeah, and then, boy, when we saw that lady with the torch. How many troops were liberated with you on the 13th, Friday the 13th? Well, it was just, it was just the 40 of us that were there at the stone quarry. And, uh, of course, then when we got to, to uh, we got over to England, then uh, there were quite a few others, maybe there were a couple hundred of us that were at least on the, on the one ship that we were, that we were on. Um, but, uh, and of course then we got into New York Harbor and uh, well, we actually we put in into New Jersey. That's where the, uh, where we disembarked and we were there in Jersey for about three days. And depending on where in the United States, <laughs> different people, you know, of, of those liberated were. And, and somebody uh, made travel arrangements as to what train to put us on or whatever. So I was put on a train with a few other guys heading for, for St. Louis. And uh, now, when you got you went to St. Louis, now did you go right to a hospital for a physical or no? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, and the food on prison you? camp, yeah, we, uh, you, you know, well, we got captured on January the fifth. <laughs> we were liberated on April the thirteenth. Uh, you know, we in, in all that time, you know. Uh, no showers, no baths, <laughs> no haircuts. Um, uh, some of the guys uh, I felt they needed to would shave. Of course, I, 
I spent my 21st birthday in a, in a German prison camp, but I didn't have any kind of a beard. And uh, so, anyway, uh, but while we were in the prison camp, you know, I don't know how long we were in there, but then, uh, I mean, you know, I began to, to itch a lot. And talk about so, the bread you know, and the cutting I'm of the bread. I'm scratching my, my head like this, and, and I just have to look at it. And of course, my, the fingernails were pretty long, because I had to clip my fingernails all my time. <coughs> I, see, I see something moving, you know. And while it was for lice, well, I thought, lice, you know, growing up, my family didn't talk about it, a lot about things like that. But I had heard enough that, boy, if anybody's got lice, <laughs> they're real low lifers, you know. <laughs> Who's got, what decent person's got lice, you know? Well, then, then I began to notice that other people were kind of looking around too. <laughs> so we okay, all now, got them. You're, so you're, we got them from those, from those, <laughs> those blankets, those horse blankets. I guess the lice came off the horses and onto us. <laughs> okay, now you're, you're you're home now, and uh, now the the war's over, and you're getting rehabbed, right? You know you're you're out of the army now, right? You you've been discharged? No, not immediately. No, I was given a 90-day furlough at home, and that was great. <laughs> no, I didn't have to do anything other than if my mom wanted me to do something or whatever. <clears throat> Spent a lot of time. going out and getting me myself ice cream cones. What was the first dinner you asked your mother to make for you? Well, that's, that's something to do. Really, the very, very first thing. <coughs> she figured <coughs> after the food I've been on or lack of food or whatever, she probably figured uh, liver would be real good for me, you know, fill up my blood or whatever. I always hated the liver, but here, here she's, frying, she's frying this stuff up. And I thought she was frying up like these little breakfast steaks or whatever. And when I, when, when I, when I discovered what it was she was making, I guess, boy, I got so, I got so ticked off. And of course, I guess, I was in a bad mood after what I'd been through anyway. And poor old mom probably almost broke her heart trying to do something good. But anyway, I stormed out of the house and took, took a walk in the neighborhood and got some ice cream and I came back up a while. But, <clears throat> and one thing, having this book here, got a list of things uh, where uh, this past the time, you could say it's almost a masochistic type of a function, but we had a lot of time to sit around and shoot the breeze, you know, and talk about this, that, and everything. And, and of course, talking about the food we liked, you know, and different guys would try to think of, of what their mom made or if they were married, and what their what their wives made, their, some of their <coughs> favorite foods or whatever. And I got some of those recipes. And uh, Go ahead and <coughs> open up a couple pages there and we'll take a look at that. Yeah, so <coughs> anyway, so somebody says something about liver and onions. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> that wasn't for me. I said, I said I'd have to almost starve before I would, <laughs> before I would eat any liver. You still have that in there? Your wife's saying she doesn't think they're in there. 
we're going to take that. We're going to we're going to copy that. We'll go in, in his uh, jacket. Well, here's some of the recipes. Oh, there is a couple. Yeah, here's some of the recipes. You put it up to the camera, uh, hell. Of course, you, you can't right read. There. You yeah, can't so, read that's that. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. But here's some of the recipes. Okay. That the different guys try to remember. I see candy up there. Yeah, they try to remember what it was to how to make some of this stuff. Uh, one guy here got something about creamed, cream candy, and he goes into, you know, um, the ingredients that went into it and so forth. Uh, next one is peanut butter candy, and it says half a cup of molasses, one cup of brown sugar, one half cup of canned milk, cook to soft ball stage, add one fourth pound of butter, one and a half cups of peanut butter, and a little bit of vanilla. And it says, beat until smooth, cook more if necessary. Then they give a recipe for peanut, peanut brittle, uh, something called maple cream fudge, um, another about candy dips, that's chocolate covered, and suggested either small marshmallows, caramels, uh, corn flakes, rice cricks, crick, <laughs> kicks. Um, is this something you did in, in, in uh, the, the in camp? camp? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, all these, these recipes as these <laughs> guys try to remember them, you know. And of course, what a masochistic thing. You're, you're real hungry, you know, but you talk about all the goodies that you'd love to eat if you had the opportunity. So how much weight did you actually lose in the whole ordeal? Well, I weighed 120 last time I weighed before I left the States. And uh, and I never, I didn't weigh, weigh myself or get weighed um, right after prison camp or right after being liberated. But um, by the time I got home to St. Louis, I weighed, weighed myself and I think I was about 105, something like 107. So <clears throat> anyway, and uh, I weigh about 120 now. <laughs> but anyway, but at least I, I've never put on a bay window. <laughs> you never talked about the food that you ate in prison camp and about how you divided the, the, the oh. slice of bread. How you divided that all up? Yeah, yeah. Well, once a week we got a. <clears throat> they bring these loaves of bread in. And they were at that size. Once a week. Huh? Once a week. Yeah. As I recall. No, I don't know how many times. Maybe it was every other day or something like that. <clears throat> but there. Are, We'd be in six-man teams, and we would number number the teams. I guess there were there had to be 36 of us. I guess at, at this in this last phase of imprisonment, but we would number us so one, two, three, four, five, six, <coughs> and then the teams numbered that way to team number one, team number two, and up to team number six. So on the very first time that we instituted this um, system, team number one and man number one would have, we figured it had some bit of advantage because team number one would look at these six loaves of bread and choose which one they thought was the biggest. <laughs> and then and then, of course, and then among, then they would, and whoever, the number one man who chose the loaf, then would cut it into six pieces. Of course, he tried to be very careful to keep it in, um, you know, even space, but didn't have any way of measuring it just by eye. So then, 
man number one would get his choice of those six slices of bread, and then number two would get second choice, and then of course then the next time we got the distribution of bread, it was team number two would get first choice, and man number number two would get first choice in his group, and so it went all the way through the whole <clears throat> the whole six. Okay, about the uh, sour bread uh, by the Germans, these loaves, um, to show you how long the Germans had been already planning their military excursions, shall we say, their attacks. This was, this had to be long before they ever uh, first attacked like Czechoslovakia. Um, on the top of every loaf was three numbers. The first number was the month of the year, uh, month, yeah, the month of the year. The next number was the day, and the last number, or, or the month, and the last number was the day. And so, for instance, well, what's today? This is, this is, yeah. Yes, March. One, eight, oh, eight. So, so if I got my loaf of bread today, or we had a loaf, you know, distribution today, you know, on the top of that, well, not necessarily, that, that loaf that we would get might have been numbered July of last year, or even before then, and there were loaves that I saw that were five or six years old. But they, they, uh, that sour dough was what kept, kept them, shall we say, edible for that period of time. But they would, they would, they had s certain barn-like buildings where they would stock up these loaves and they would pack them on, 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 uh, <clears throat> some kind of wooden platforms or whatever, stack one on top of the other and distribute in between um, pine ground, ground, uh, ground sawdust. So there was any number of times we would get a loaf of bread that we'd have to brush off the sawdust. We didn't want to eat the sawdust. And so that was all part of this condition, and like I say, there were one loaf that I saw dated back about five years earlier, and sometime, you know, within that earlier period of time. So the Germans were planning their whatever they were doing for quite a while before before Hitler hit his first aggression, you know. So that's as much as I got to say okay. about the bread. Well, now, okay, uh, you, um, did you have rehab time before you went for your release from the army? Oh yeah, as soon as I got home, I got my 90 day furlough, and then I, I was sent down to camp. I forget the name of the camp, but it's down in Arkansas near Little Rock, and I was there. The war was still going on in Europe, and we were constantly pushing the Germans back over there until they finally ended up somewhere up in Austria, and that's where the last segments of the German army um, finally surrendered, and it was well after the time that I had gotten home. But then the war in the Pacific hadn't, hadn't finished up, too. We still had near uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima that hadn't happened yet. You know, it was the atom bombs. And uh, so anyway, um, what was I going to say? 
Oh, I was sent back, I was sent down to Arkansas as a tr part of a training, training cadre to train people for overseas because they were still sending the rotating troops, bringing troops back that had been over there for whatever period of time or guys that had been wounded or whatever on the rotation system and say they were sending replacements over there and uh, so I was part of training those guys and I trained them on the various weapons, the M1 rifle, the carbine, the 45 caliber sidearm, the BAR, the Browning Automatic Rifle, which fires like a, a slow machine gun, uh, the bazooka for fighting against tanks, and, uh, and the light and heavy machine guns, etc. And uh, so, anyway, and of course, I, one of my things was to, to put these guys through short order drill too. So, you know, hut, hup, hip, hup, hup, and up. <laughs> and, you know, to the rear march, to the rear march. <laughs> flank left, flank right. But uh, anyway, so it was teaching these guys, and really the main thing, and I was told later, and I, I, I kind of had to figure it out myself too, that all this marching and training and the various things and and how how to how, what's the proper way to to throw a throw a hand grenade and all this kind of stuff um, is all to help the individual soldier or marine uh, anybody that's particularly on 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 land, land warfare is how to be an efficient soldier, how to be able to kill the enemy or shoot him before he shoots you. And uh, so this was all, and it was good discipline. And it was also a, a discipline to the point where when an officer said, do something, you never said, well, why? I mean, he said it, you did it. In other words, we used to have a little saying, my Duty is not to ask my why. My answer is to do or die. What was your rate at this time? Pardon? I was a PFC. It was after I was liberated, and uh, when I was sent down there to Arkansas to train the troops for that were going to be sent over as replacements, and then I was given my my. Uh, Purple stripes. And so that's, that's that's as high a rank as I went. Okay, where 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 when did you first hear about uh, Hiroshima? Where were you? Oh boy, I don't even remember that. Okay, then okay, then the other bomb. Now, when did you first hear the the uh, DJ day? You got to know where you, you were there. Victor over Japan. Oh, I was already home by that time. You are you out now? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh. Okay. Then how, then okay. You're home now, and did you did you go out and seek a job now? Uh, yeah. Well, I had a I had a buddy who was in the from, you know, from civilian life before the war. He and I had gone to art school together. <coughs> and uh, he was he was in the Navy Air Force and he was he was a guy that really caught on to things like that pretty fast. And he did so well in the uh, Navy Air Force that they made him a a trainer. And so he was training uh, Navy pilots 
and on a, on a training uh, mission when he had a, a training up. They were in a, a two-seater, the instructor would sit in the back, and a trainee up in front, and a trainee was at, at the controls. And so, anyway, the guy came in for a landing and misjudged his distances or whatever, and crash landed the, the plane, and the trainee was killed, and Wally, my buddy, got his, got his one leg, I think, one leg got all banged up, broken, multiple broken bones. And so he got out of the service very early. And, uh, and uh, as well as being very gifted in, in those kind of things, um, he was a terrific artist too. He could really, really draw real tremendous. I was never much of an illustrator, but he could do a lot of illustrating. And so during the war in advertising agencies, uh, with most of the guys all gone, off to the service, uh, they have a lot of gals that worked for them, and I'm not implying that these girls were doing a good job, but uh, a lot of these guys now were coming back and wanted to get back into in, into the advertising art business again, and a lot of these gals wanted to stay home because their guys were coming home, and if they heard it. Or he'll get a job, so I'm going to stay home and raise a family. But anyway, whatever the case was, um, these ad agencies and art studios were looking for for veterans that were out and were looking for a job in, in that field. And so that's that's how I got a job. Uh, my friend Wally, he, he recommended me to their head art director, and he interviewed me. and. And so that's where I got my start in advertising art, just doing pay stuff. You know, the guys that were accomplished designers, they would do a rough layout, and then and uh, and we had typesetters would set up the type, and then we had the pay stuff guys that would follow that rough diagram, put the trim the photos, put them in the right place, and paste all the columns down and so on and so forth. And then of course that would go into the, into the camera room to be shot on film and, and made into plates, you know, the offset uh, way of, of printing. And uh, so anyway, so Wally was always one jump ahead of me in all these accomplishments. And he get a job at, at, a, at a good agency, a little while they He'd find out that they needed somebody in this department and that department, and he knew that those were my qualifications. And so he'd give me a buzz. Are you interested in this job? Come down and interview. So I followed him from, oh, anyway, three, maybe three or four different jobs that way. Different where was this at? Pardon? Where was this at? What, 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 what uh, state, city? Well, that was in St. Louis. So still in St. Louis? Yeah. Now, how, how, did, how did you meet your wife? Uh, well, when I came home from overseas, I had one sore throat after another. After I made about my third bout with sore throat, and uh, you know, I went to the doctor, and he says, enough's enough. He looked at my throat, and he says, those tonsils have to come out. So they put me in the, in the hospital and went in there and one day and uh, supposed to have surgery the next morning. And a uh, cute student nurse came in and I tried to make a date with her. Well, she had her steady boyfriend. But she says, but I have a roommate and she isn't going with anybody now. Now, if you'd like, I can set up a blind date. I said, sure, you know, 
I'm young and fond of prowl. So, can on. So we're going to go on this blind date uh, on on Sunday afternoon. We're going to go t take in a movie, and uh, so I went over over at this hospital, the Lutheran Hospital in St. Louis, which was in about six blocks from my house, and um, we were going to go take in a movie. And so they had a it was a big enough hospital. They had a lot of these nurses in training. So they had a special home adjacent to the hospital for these gals. So I went over here to, to uh, meet my blind date and I was ready to take off. Like I say, it was about six blocks from home, walking distance. And uh, my mom insisted I take an umbrella. Oh, I hated umbrellas. I figured I looked like a geek with an umbrella anyway. <laughs> But she said, she says, without an umbrella, you don't leave home. Okay, Mom. So I took the umbrella and you know, walked away from home. It was raining. Huh? It was raining. <laughs> it, yeah, it was raining. So I got over there to the nurse's home and, and met Rosemary. And so the other couple was there. We're ready to take off the hop the streetcar to go to downtown St. Louis to a big movie house there. So I said, I'm not going to carry this umbrella. So we hid it behind some drapes in the in the reception area, and off we went to the movie. And so that's that's what started our big romance. Okay, yeah. and uh, when did you get married? Pardon? Uh, do, do you remember when you proposed? Yeah, probably. It wasn't. It wasn't. But just a couple, three weeks or whatever. It wasn't long. There right? it is. You know, this, this gal seems like she's going to put up with me. So. Did you get on your knee, bend the knee to? Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember that part. Yeah. They kind of mutually agreed, I guess. I don't know. And uh, what did you marry in St. Louis? Yeah. Okay. When I was in nurses' training, we couldn't get married. Huh? was in nurses training. We couldn't get married. We weren't allowed to be married. Uh -huh. <laughs> but did, did, we, did you did you not tell them or what? Oh, well, or, or we, were, you were, you we were, were engaged, already. but we knew if, if we got married, I'd be kicked out. So, but, but you finished your training before we did get married, right? Well, yeah. Yeah. But she had a, had she that had, much sense. but she had a roommate, that gal that I first tried to, kind of tried to uh, date, but she and her boyfriend they did go ahead and get married, and they had to keep it quiet. No, oh. they, she got kicked out. It oh, was she, Alice who kept it quiet. Oh yeah. She was even pregnant when we were. Yeah, I guess the other gal was flashing her, her wedding ring. Okay, then uh, did you set up set up household in St. Louis, right? Oh yeah, but uh, with the war and, and all that kind of stuff, and and no, not really any building going on and whatever, and all these GIs coming back and getting married and so on and so forth, they had difficulty in in finding places to to live, places to rent, and who could afford to buy something, you know, on a on a you know. On, on a startup job or whatever, so we got a a job, a, a room in a or the wid widow's home that she had a spare bedroom, and we had bathroom and, and kitchen privileges, and uh, so how long were we there? About six months. Yeah, we were there for a while, a year or so. And then my my folks lived in a four-family, what they call a four-family flat apartment downstairs on both each side and then upstairs. And uh, <coughs> I've been in a family, you know, in our family you know, from my mother's side for oh, at least a hundred years or something like that. 
in South St. Louis. And so uh, my mother and father uh, occupied the, the flat on the one side, and upstairs from them was vacant. So we were able to move up there and go, oh, I don't know how long we were. I guess we lived there until we moved to California, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how many uh, children did you have? Well, when we moved to California, we had two. E Eric, the oldest son, was what? Was he four? No, well, no, three. I think three and two. What? Three and two. Yeah. Yeah, David was one year and two weeks younger than his older brother. Eric's a manufacturer, manufactures custom furniture, and David is a commercial artist. And we have three girls. Yeah. How old are they? Cindy just had her 50th birthday, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Debbie is what, 47, 48? Mm -hmm. And Heidi is 44. Sorry. And you know Heidi. <laughs> it's hard to believe. <laughs> okay, you know, then. Well, the, oh, you remember Dale. Dale. Uh, I think Dale James. James. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, well, he and Heidi were married. Oh, yeah. well, they're not married now. anymore, but that, that wedding broke up, but anyway. He was in here one time, I think, Dale James. Oh. Um, did you ever meet or know uh, Melton Kniff? Oh, yeah. No, Caniff? Yeah. Yeah, he was a cartoonist. Right, he, uh, yes, right, he, uh, he's the one that inspired uh, Greg, because he's left-handed. Oh, really? So he, we were real good friends, and yeah. uh, Greg uh, worked for him before he died. Oh, That's really right. something. Okay, well, listen, what I'd like you to do is to just say something to your family. A little greeting to your family. And, yeah. Okay? Okay. Well, family, I'm just agreeing. You've seen this book, and so this is much of which you see on this recording, this film recording, is, is in the contents of this book. But then in this interview, and I'm thanking Mr. Andrade here for kindly interviewing me and, and uh, recording this, it has much of what we have discussed in this book that you guys have read, but expanded on it, and, and of course, in voice uh, uh, recording and so on and so forth, and photo recording uh, gives more life and understanding and et cetera uh, than the cold type in the book. So I think uh, Bob Andrade here. I want you to stand beside him. Oh dear, oh dear. Who am I drink here? Okay, would you introduce your wife for us, please? Oh dear. Yeah, yeah this is my wife, Rosemary. Uh, Still a beautiful woman. Yes, I think so. <laughs> and, uh, we'll be married 60. Uh, How long have you been married? Yeah, we'll, well, we'll be celebrating our 60th anniversary in June, and so she's put up with me for a long time. And uh, we enjoy a lot of things, and uh, um, nothing real flamboyant or, or too ex expensive. We've made, what now, two or three trips over to Germany? Four. Yeah, well, that's, well, that's four. Okay, yeah. Now that you can tell us together, what was it like to go back after all those years and, and, and uh, having your, your has Rosemary with you? Well, what happened, what uh, made it pleasant, well, I, I think there's very few Germans that can't speak English and understand it, maybe in some small, 
remote village, there might be some elderly people that have difficulty with it, but I, I rather rather doubt it. But but there were certain situations and and things where she could speak to these people in German because she speaks excellent German. All I all I know is the bad words, and that don't count or shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so on these trips over there to, to Germany, and, and we've been to Latvia because there was a missionary friend of ours that was serving as a missionary in Latvia, and we visited him and his wife, and it was a great experience. And uh, so we've been able to travel, and uh, we love to travel, and so Anyway, God is good. Okay, would, would, would you say something, Rosemary, please? Well, um, uh, our first, no, it would be our second trip. We went to Germany, and then uh, we, uh, by that time, the, the wall had come down, the Berlin Wall had come down, so then we could go past that <coughs> barrier and we were able to find uh, a prison camp where he had been. Um, and that was quite an undertaking because we had to take a cab and, and try to figure it all out. But How but, did you know you found it? Well, because when we, when we uh, arrived at that place, it, you know, some things had changed. Um, uh, and the owner had moved, although the people living there knew who he was talking about, the woman that had helped him. They, they knew that family, but they had moved away. And so uh, that was a connection. And then also uh, when we were in the cab, again it was raining, it was a dreary day, and then he, he, he says, oh, there is, there is the road. There is the road where the the uh, trucks came around that you corner. Recognize that, huh? They recognized that. They recognized that that road along the forest, that curve, and where they recognized the, the truck that had come. And with did the you ones. find a quarry? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, we did. We did find it. Yeah. And was it's just very interesting because uh, the we had to ca take a cab and. Um, the cab driver was a Russian, a former Russian, and uh, it was just uh, such a different experience um, talking to this cab driver in German who was a Russian. I mean, you know, it just, the war just confuses everything, you know? And he was interested in the story, too. Now, that's yeah. really great. Okay, well, okay, we're going to shut this off, but thank you, thank you very, very much. That was, that was a great interview. Okay. Well, some of the, yeah, well, you're turning it off, right? Okay, here it goes. <laughs> well, there was the one experience that he t has told me about um, that he didn't mention about when, um, uh, I don't know at what point it was, but he had been uh, shooting and he had been, you know, in uh, combat, uh, such as it was, and it was crossing this bridge. Well, let me pick it up. Yeah, you pick it up then. When I, I mentioned about that BAR man at, before we got captured, that was really blasting away at these Germans and stacking them up like, like logs, you know. Well, at that point where, where they were coming over this bridge, um, that's where he was really concentrating his fire. And so then, when we were finally forced to surrender, we were marched back over that bridge, and all the bodies stacked up. And then, the way this bridge was built, it was like a low stone wall on each side of the of the uh, of the of the bridge, and we had to walk to the. To our left of, of of those bodies stacked up, and just before we stepped off the bridge, uh, over against the stone wall, 
was a, a man, a German soldier, on a bicycle, and he'd been killed, but when he, when he fell over and he was tilted over, that, that wall held up the bicycle, and the, and the, and the man, he was still on the bicycle, and his, his glasses were kind of hanging like this, and they were dark, black, horn-rimmed glasses that remind me of the glasses that my grandfather wore. And so that really grabbed me. I figured, well, that, that could be my grandpa hanging there. Well, be something, huh? Yeah. Okay, thank you again very much.